<laughs> awesome. Um, well, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it. Uh, so, some of you in the audience, actually most of you probably have some idea of what science illustration is, but often when I say I'm a science illustrator, and I'm sure my, my students sitting in the audience get this question a lot, what is science illustration? Um, when I get that question, I basically tell people that it's artwork or an illustration that explains or communicates science. Um, so these illustrations can be things like traditional field guide IDs. Um, they can illustrate a behavior or a certain relationship between a plant and animal or any sorts of organisms. Um, they can be instructional diagrams like how to or a process based illustration. They can also be infographics, which are sort of combined, their illustrations combined with a lot of text, um, like you would see in National Geographic, for example, um, and they explain more how something works. They can reveal hidden structures, and they can do any or all of the above, and a lot of combinations of all of the above, and by no means is this an exhaustive list either. Um, and then, as far as explaining science goes, uh, historically speaking, science illustration has kind of been this natural history, biology, um, ecology sort of field. But nowadays, um, science illustrators go for topics in physics and chemistry, anthropology, so illustrating artifacts um, from digs, uh, paleontology, they can uh, illustrate things like large-scale earth processes from geology, um, engineering, and then also there's a whole field of medical illustration as well. Um, and people who do medical illustrations are also science illustrators. Um, and then as science illustrators, we like to play, pay close attention to accuracy in our illustrations um, because we're trying to communicate um, accurate science. And then we also focus on usability of our graphics. Uh, we want to create something that's really clear and brings the focus to what's important. Um, so what was Science Illustration's original purpose? How did it kind of come about? Um, it was basically a means to learn about and catalog the natural world through carefully observing things and accurately recording information about them. So as scientists, um, which I think most of you are in the audience, uh, you probably are thinking this is a lot like what we do. Uh, so yeah, as science illustrators, we do the same sorts of thing that, things that scientists do, but we use illustrations instead of um, data to present um, the scientific information. And then also, on top of just being an exploration and pursuit of knowledge, uh, science illustrations were meant to share things about the natural world with the general public. So before the internet and photographs, we had illustrations. Uh, so these three illustrations down here are just examples from, uh, from history. Uh, the first one is from 1705 by an artist named Maria Sibylla Marion. Um, and she was really into insects and the idea of metamorphosis. And so she made, she kind of got the idea of metamorphosis out there to the general public. Um, people didn't really know what that was at first. Uh, the second one is by Sidney Parkinson. He was a botanical illustrator in the late 1700s. And he joined James Cook on his first voyage to the Pacific. And he actually died on that expedition too. He created over a thousand drawings though before he died on the expedition. And then, of course, we all know who John James Audubon was, um, <coughs> the famous naturalist who also illustrated the birds of America in the 1800s. So now that you guys have a little bit, hopefully, better understanding of what science illustration is, um, I'm basically just going to kind of go through my background and how I got into the field, um, because I'm still kind of starting out uh, as a professional science illustrator. So I'm going to talk about how, as a science student, um, I used artwork um, in my early days. <laughs> so as an undergraduate, uh, I double majored in, in studio art and marine biology. Um, and I learned that I could use art in my science classes as a really awesome learning tool. Um, so often I would come home from classes uh, and take the class notes that I had written down and I would actually like make my own diagrams uh, because I'm a really visual learner. Um, and so the process of taking that information 
and kind of distilling it or translating it through my brain into my hand um, really helped me le learn the material. Uh, I was also required for some of my science classes, uh, mostly my invertebrate zoology classes, to, to draw in, in lab time um, and keep a detailed lab manual. So this is an example of one of those old illustrations, um, actually done at Friday Harbor Labs back in the day. Um, and so I basically realized through doing these, these sorts of things, using art in my science classes, that it encouraged me and enabled me to observe things more closely. Um, and I also retained information better uh, by having to draw it. So after a couple years, uh, my first couple years as an undergraduate, I decided I, I knew something about science illustration. I didn't really know that it was a viable career option yet, uh, but I knew that it existed, at least historically. And so I worked with my ichthyology professor and created my own directed independent study class in science illustration. Um, and we worked together to create some drawings, some updated drawings for our ichthyology lab manual uh, for other students to use. And then also he partnered me, he helped partner me with the North Carolina Department of Marine Fisheries. And uh, I did some otolith illustrations for them. So otoliths are fish ear bones for those of you that don't know. Um, and there's three species of kingfish in North Carolina that externally are really similar and very difficult to distinguish. Uh, but if you remove their ear bones, you can tell them apart. Uh, so the te technicians were able to take my illustrations out into the field and use them for identification. Um, after undergraduate, I decided I wanted to continue in science and get my master's, and then I thought I would probably go on and get my PhD and enter academia, which did not happen. <laughs> uh, so during my master's, I kind of moved from, I still used art as a learning tool in my classes, but I also learned that I could really use my skills uh, to communicate science. So during one of my first years, uh, or I think it was my first year <laughs> as a graduate student, uh, I worked with a, a researcher down in Florida, Chris Stallings, and uh, did a three panel illustration for him. He had witnessed this novel behavior uh, on the reefs off of Florida. These fish down at the bottom are gag grouper. Uh, so what normally happens is the gag grouper hang out near the substrate and there's this bait ball of food above them and they can't really access it that well because the bait ball is so high up in the water column. Um, but occasionally, like in panel B, a school of amberjack will come in and push the bait ball down towards the substrate and then the gag grouper can feed off of that bait ball. And so what Chris uh, witnessed in the field that he wanted to, descri to describe was this novel behavior where the gag grouper, a couple of them actually had learned to swim up above the bait ball and push it down, and that way they could all feed on it without the presence of the amberjacks. Um, so that was really fun for me. It was my first published paper, and it was for illustrations, <laughs> not for science research um, of my own. So uh, I did that, and that was really fun. And then I also learned that I could use my artistic skills for, for disseminating my own research, so for talks at conferences. Um, I don't have an example of, of the illustration I'm about to talk about, because uh, I couldn't find it on, in my old files. But uh, my research was based, as a master's student, was based around larval fish development. Um, and so the species I was working with has kind of complex growth histories as larvae, and then they go through metamorphosis and they settle to the reef, and they have a couple of behaviors that they can follow once they settle to the reef. And at each level of their development, there's uh, mortality that acts upon those, uh, upon those fish. Um, and so it was this really complex uh, pattern of growth and behavior, and I needed to be able to explain it really quickly because I only had 12 minutes for a scientific conference talk. Um, and so I was able to, I sat down at my desk as a graduate student and started drawing a little diagram that was just arrows and words. Um, and I came up with something that I was able to walk people through during, during scientific talks. And then they were able to be on board and understand the rest of my research findings. Um, so yeah, I found at the end of my graduate studies that in science that um, I had this unique ability to serve as somebody who could translate um, research into digestible images, either by other people in science or by the public. 
So um, I decided at the end of my master's that I was going to depart from hard science and go the route of science illustration. Um, and I attended the amazingly wonderful science illustration certificate program locally here at CSUMB. So during that program, um, I took a bunch of traditional classes, so pen and ink and watercolor and gouache and acrylic painting, um, and then also some digital media classes, so using Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. And I actually like combining the two the best, so working both with traditional media and digital media. And then I also made it my goal during the program to try and partner with scientists as frequently as I could instead of just kind of working uh, by myself. So below is one example of an illustration that came about by working with two entomologists. Uh, this is a little inflated beetle, which is found in the deserts in California. So I saw one in Death Valley and was totally intrigued by this little tiny bumbling beetle. It's actually a blister beetle. And, uh, we had this assignment in the science illustration program to do a form and function illustration. And so when I had gotten home from the desert, I read up about these guys and found that they have um, fused elytra, which are their wing coverings. And underneath those elytra, they have this dead air space. Um, and then in addition to that, they, have, they secrete uh, nitrogenous waste through their pores, I guess. Actually, nobody really knows how they secrete it. Uh, and that covers their body too, so all of the white patterning on there is actually nitrogenous secretions. And um, both of these ad adaptations help with thermoregulation in the desert. So I talked to a couple of the entomologists who back in the 70s had done research on these beetles and made sure that I got all of my information correct and all of the tarsi, the little leg segments are properly counted and even the, even the antennae, um, segments are, I think there's like 13 or something. They were like, oh, you've got to put 13 in there. <laughs> so I was like, thanks for telling me. <laughs> um, so yeah, that came about from working with them. Um, I also worked with a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz uh, to illustrate his study system, which is this beautiful, uh, delicate flower called Lithophragma balanderi, and um, a little tiny moth, Grea politella, and uh, they have this co-evolved mutualism with each other where the moth actually lays her eggs into the ovary of the flower. And those eggs, when they hatch, they eat some of the seeds, just a few of them, and develop um, eventually into moths. Um, and then the flower benefits by being pollinated during oviposition. Um, so this was another kind of hidden structure illustration. Again, this is traditional and digital media combined. Um, and then finally, I got to work with a science writer at UC Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz also. So they have a science writing program there. Um, and so Lindsay Wissell was one of the science writing students last year, and I got partnered with her on her article called Trawling for Genes. And that highlighted Jonathan Zare's research at UC Santa Cruz, and I created this fun conceptual illustration of cyanobacteria DNA getting sucked into a CTD rosette um, and the ship above. It kind of reminds me of Ghostbusters a little bit, the like glowing green, um, like radioactive DNA or something. <laughs> so yeah, it was really fun to work with her as well, and she was, she was working to get his research out there to more of you know, a, a public platform where, where the public could actually digest some of his research, and I got to create the face for her article. So um, I finished the science illustration program, and as part of that program, we have to do an internship, a 10-week internship. So uh, I went to Friday Harbor Labs, um, which is a beautiful place. If you've never been and you're a scientist, you should try to find a way to get there, <laughs> um, take a class or something. So one of the first projects I worked on there um, was this illustration for a couple of co-authors at the labs. And they wanted something that would summarize all of their research to be an opening figure in their manuscript. And um, it was interesting for me to, to illustrate this because it's kind of all different levels of magnification. Um, so I had to find a way to show how bull kelp um, kind of degrades on the distal end of the blades from, from currents and wave action. Um, and what ends up happening is it sloughs off these detrital cells 
And those detrital cells are actually really highly nutritious food for larval sea urchins, which is the white spaceship looking thing there, if you've never seen a larval, larval sea urchin. Um, and so then the sea urchins feed on these detrital cells and they settle to the reef and grow into adults. But the thing is that the adults eat the bull kelp. So if you have high productivity in, in the bull kelp forest, um, you're gonna get a lot of settlement of, of, of urchin larvae, which are then going to decimate the forest. So it's kind of this mechanism for um, the switch between urchin barrens and um, healthy kelp forests or vice versa. Um, I also did kind of a fun sort of public outreach, public science communication project there. Uh, so under the lab, or in the lab's main building, um, underneath the stairs, there's this cool flow through seawater table, or th flow through seawater tank, um, that has a bunch of the local <coughs> intertidal organisms housed there. And um, a lot of the public comes through to the labs and goes through that main building. And so they go down to the tank and they look in and they see all of the cool animals, but there's no information about them. Uh, so they don't even know what they are. So I propose that I do some illustrations for them over the summer. And these are eight of the 13 that I did and got to install before I left and actually got to see some kids using them, like pointing at my illustrations and saying, oh, look, that's what it is, like showing their parents. <laughs> so that was really rewarding for me um, and a great addition to the labs. So um, I just want to leave you guys with kind of ideas for how you as scientists can collaborate with either science illustrators or other um, artists like the speakers tonight. Um, so for me, kind of my like personal goal is to revive arts in the science classrooms. Um, even at like the, the, the collegiate level, um, I think it's really important to tell people or make people aware that they can use um, art artistic abilities or, or just use drawing in general as a way to more closely observe things in science and to learn more about them. Um, and then also, I think that it's really important to focus on using art as a science communication tool, which everyone's talking about tonight. Um, art can sell your research. I'm gonna push that pretty strongly. So. Um, I think that it's great as scientists, um, if you have some money like left in some grants to hire a, a science illustrator, that's great. Um, but I think it's also important to kind of think ahead of time too when you're writing a grant, um, think about the broader impacts, think about whether you might use an illustration um, in a manuscript or, or in a magazine article um, and hire a science illustrator. Uh, and then you can also hire science writers. I'm not a science writer, but I know a lot of really great ones um, to get your work out into more publicly accessible platforms. And then also you can learn the basics yourself. Uh, so you don't have to have amazing artistic skills to draw your own diagrams or make your graphs pretty. Um, and actually we have summer classes at CSUMB in the science illustration program. Um, so we have three this summer. Uh, the first and second ones are taught by Amadeo Bachar. Um, the first one is marine science illustration. So that's focusing on a lot of traditional um, media. So watercolor and graphite. Uh, the second one will be a new course. It's digital science il illustration. You don't have to have any background in Adobe programs. All levels are welcome. Uh, and that's going to focus on um, incorporating traditional and digital illustration into a final illustration for that class. And then I'm going to be teaching field sketching, which is a little bit less science-y, but a, a lot of fun. <laughs> I won't say a lot more fun, I'll just say a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but you get to go outside into nature and sketch um, tide pools or, you know, a little sea urchin test that you find and learning techniques that can help you gather information quickly into a drawing. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you guys listening to me talk about science illustration. Thank you. <laughs>